send to the sky. Ooh, okay, and now I'll pass it on to Annie to introduce herself. Thanks, Eileen. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Annie. I'm also a rising senior from Maryland, um, and I'm the other co-founder of STEM to the Sky. We're incredibly excited to have you all here today, and thank you so much for joining us. I will pass it to Anaga. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Anaga. I'm the National Marketing and Outreach Director at STEM to the Sky. Um, I'm an incoming high school junior from Maryland. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'll be passing it on to Sari. Hi everyone, my name is Sari and I'm the International Marketing and Outreach Director at STEM to the Sky and I'm an incoming freshman at the University of Tokyo. I will be co-hosting alongside Anaga today and again thank you all for coming. As a quick warm-up, please type your name, grade, and where you're joining us from in the chat. And a special thank you to our panelists, Dr. Lin, Dr. Weigold, and Lila Ada, who will be sharing their wonderful insights and experiences with us today. We got some Maryland, Tokyo, Japan. Quite a bit of Tokyo. New York, New York City as well. That's so cool. I love how our audience is so international. Ontario. <laughs> Ontario. That's really great. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, so to, for today's event, we hope to showcase the diversity and the wide array of opportunities in the field of medicine and healthcare to students across the globe, as yourself, as you know, we can tell by the chat, we have people joining in from all over the world, and perhaps inspire you to explore and pursue a career in medicine yourself. Our three panelists today will be sharing their respective careers, experiences, and advice in many difficult uh, medical fields, sorry, including cardiology, neurology, and biomedical engineering. And of course, there are many other fields to explore, but today we're very excited and grateful to have Dr. Lin, Dr. Weigold, and Lila here to speak with you today. And here is an overview of today's event. So first, we'll have Eileen briefly introduce them to the sky and our mission. Then our three amazing panelists will introduce themselves and they will give a general overview of their background and their careers. Then we will transition into the main part of the event, a Q&A and discussion. Using the topics all of you have provided us from the event RSVP form, the panelists will offer deeper insights into what pursuing medicine really means. Then we will open up the floor to any live questions you guys may have for the panelists. And finally, to wrap up the event, we will share our panelists' contact information in case you want to reach out with any further questions. We will also discuss how you can get involved with STEM in the Sky. Thanks, Anaga. So a little bit about STEM in the Sky. So we are a student-led 501c3 nonprofit founded back in 2020. So our mission is really to showcase diverse careers um, as well as faces in STEM. So we do this primarily through interviews but we hope to empower students all around the world, no matter their background, to pursue their STEM aspirations. And at the same time, we hope to advocate for a more equitable STEM community. So how we do this, um, we have many different initiatives. So as I mentioned, we post bi-weekly interviews with STEM professionals and actually, we're really soon going to start a student series as well. So it's going to be interviews with both professionals and students. And we also host speaker panels and events like this one, as well as Sunday spotlights on our Instagram. So these are just little infographics that showcase different interesting facts within science. And then we also have a, an upcoming initiative consisting of like educator resources that we hope that, that we hope will diversify the STEM curriculum. So yeah, a lot of exciting initiatives coming up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think we'll be putting some of the links in the chat in case you guys are interested in um, clicking on them and exploring some of them. Yep, just saw that Sasha posted our website. Cool, a little bit more about some of this guy's growth. Um, throughout like the last two years, we've reached 30 team members, which is super exciting, and featured 30 different interviews. We've also reached 60 different countries around the world, um, and this includes 300, over 300 schools as well. So we're really excited to um, grow even more and expand our international audience. Now let's go into the panelist introductions.
Um, without further ado, please welcome neurologist Dr. Lin, who will start us off. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you. This is pretty exciting. Um, so I'm going to go over like what my education background is, where I've been. Uh, so uh, I went to undergrad at you know, uh, Penn State. So that's in Pennsylvania. And the program I was in was a combined bachelor MD degree. So I spent about two years doing, well, so it's, you have to do summers and then two full years of college. So if you do the math and I have like AP credits. So that, and then after that, I did the full traditional four years of medical school. So after I finished medical school, I did one year of internship at Georgetown. And then I did three years of neurology residency training at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And then I went back, came back to the East Coast and did my neurophysiology, clinical neurophysiology fellowship at Johns Hopkins. And then I've been in private practice in Rockville, Maryland, which is a suburb of DC uh, since then. So free time, I like to spend time with family, traveling and shopping, but of course not much traveling now because of pandemic, but mostly spending time exercising, shopping for now. Thanks so much, Dr. Lin. Yeah, I, I also really enjoy traveling and shopping. So, you know. I'm having, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of that over the summer and I hope you are too. Thank you so much. Now I will be passing it on to Dr. Weigold. Hello everyone. And thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor. Um, so just to uh, review my educational background. Um, so I uh, uh, studied undergrad at the University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois and uh, got a um, Bachelor uh, of Arts degree in biology. Uh, and that was uh, the time when I uh, began to have the inkling and idea that I wanted to pursue a career in medicine. Um, went to medical school at the University of Minnesota um, and then did internship and residency at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, which is part of the Northwestern University system in Chicago, Illinois. Came out to Washington, D.C. for cardiovascular disease fellowship at Washington Hospital Center. Uh, joined the uh, faculty there, actually, um, and was there for a long time, about 15 years or so. Uh, and then more recently, last year, uh, joined a practice up here in uh, uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, with Adventist Healthcare and the White Oak Medical Center. So I've been practicing cardiology for about 20 years, um, have a special area of interest and expertise in cardiovascular CT. Um, and it's been a great, uh, you know, a great career and a great experience. So definitely encourage uh, anyone interested in a medical career to pursue it, check it out, find out about it um, and, uh, you know, learn more. Oh, so, uh, uh, things change a lot when you have a family. Um, and so I wanted to kind of show this slide as an example of just how, um, you know, uh, once you, once you have a family, you have to really work hard to balance work and family life. It's not hard work. It's just you, it's something you need to be mindful of. So at the bottom, there are three photos and these were all taken within a few days of each other. So at the, at the left, is uh, one of our dogs. Um, in the middle is a picture taken from a meeting I attended uh, in Korea. And at the right is uh, one of my daughters with a neighborhood cat. And um, it's just, I juxtapose these three together because again, you know, it's just a picture of how, especially if you get involved in um, academic medicine, uh, there's a lot of travel and a lot of, um, time. And even if you're not in academics and you're in uh, private practice, you're spending a lot of time at work. Uh, but uh, it's very, very important to find the right balance between work and home life. 
the upper right photo is a, a picture that kind of uh, conveys uh, both my love of the outdoors and it's a you can see my three daughters that are there so that's really where the majority of my time um, is spent when I'm not working I'm, I'm with my family uh, and try to just enjoy the outdoors as much as possible. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Weigold. I think it's really interesting how um, the contrast between your personal life and your um, medical life is really interesting. Um, I also love hiking and fishing. I hope you've been able to do that a lot this summer. Yes. Um, yeah, finally, we'd like to welcome Lila, who is currently an MD-PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins University. Hey everyone, it's great to it's great to be here with you all. Um, yeah, my name is Lila Atta. I'm currently in my fifth year of my MD PhD. Uh, just started my fifth year uh, at Johns Hopkins. Um, I grew up in Cairo, Egypt, and I uh, came to the U.S. Uh, to start college, where um, I studied biomedical or biological engineering at MIT. Um, I had some sort of uh, inkling that I might be interested in medicine when I first started college, but um, definitely came in with an open mind, which is how I ended up studying engineering. Um, and then towards the end of uh, my undergrad, I started becoming interested um, in kind of big data, um, uh, data analysis, statistics, and data science. Um, and that's sort of what led me to pursue an MD-PhD. I was interested in exploring that interest further and um, seeing how it might uh, apply to medicine in the future. And so in my uh, MD-PhD, I'm doing my PhD in the biomedical engineering department with a focus on um, computational biology. Um, and I'm interested in developing um, mathematical and computational methods to help us better analyze kind of big data in biology and medicine. Um, yeah, I think the next slide. Um, are some of the things I like to do outside of kind of my primary research. Um, I'm really interested in education, uh, both medical education and kind of data science education, which is um, sort of how I ended up in a lot of kind of these uh, mentorship uh, programs, um, both in undergrad and as an MD-PhD student. Um, and then outside of school, um, in my free time, I like to read a lot. I um, During the beginning of the pandemic, I got into running and I ran my first 10K last year and hoping to run a half marathon this year. Um, yeah, and I like spending time with uh, friends and family and um, going to art museums and uh, taking photos. Awesome, thanks so much, Lila, rooting for you on that half marathon. <laughs> Um, but yeah, actually, Lila was interviewed by Send of the Sky a while back, so she will be the first establishment in our upcoming student series, which is really exciting. So everyone stay tuned for that. So now that you've heard briefly from each of our panelists, we will now open up the floor to the part that you've all been waiting for, the panel discussion and Q&A. So I will stop my screen share now, and then I will pass it off to Sari. Thanks, Annie. Wait, give me a couple of seconds to spotlight our panel for today. Okay, so before we uh, do some live questions, we wanted to go through the most frequently asked questions from the RSVP form. And so panelists, feel free to piggyback off of each other's answers. So let's get on to the first question. Our first question is, what does a typical day in the life look for you? It's a pretty broad question, but you know, go ahead and um, piggyback off of each other. Um, anything that's on your mind? Yep, go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll start. So um, I'm in private practice. I start my day at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, so it's usually patient care. So I see patients, uh, answer phone calls, we fill prescriptions, uh, and then my day usually ends about 3.30 for clinical care. And then I finish up whatever paperwork I need to do. And I usually hope to be home by 4.30. So that's Monday through Fridays. And on the weekends, sometimes I take call. Um, so, you know, just phone calls, but otherwise weekends and evening times are pretty much free to do whatever I wanna do. Okay, I guess I'll go second. That's great. Uh, um, so I'm part of a 
cardiovascular uh, practice that's uh, about a half a dozen cardiologists, and we provide the cardiology services in our clinic and also provide uh, uh, cardiology coverage for the hospital, which is right next to our clinic office building. Um, so it consists of uh, seeing patients in clinic. We do a lot of, also of diagnostic testing uh, and, um, and provide, uh, you know, seeing, providing the cardiovascular services for the patients that are in the hospital, hospitalized, and being on call for whatever cardiovascular um, uh, consults are needed uh, and on call for um, acute demise, um, myocardial infarctions, that's heart attacks and doing uh, uh, catheterizations. So um, I am a general cardiologist. Uh, so my work consists of um, seeing patients in the office. Uh, like Dr. Lin, it starts pretty early in the morning. Um, and most days are spent uh, seeing patients in the office, um, uh, reading diagnostic testing. Uh, and then depending on who's covering the hospital, I may go to the hospital and round on the patients in the hospital. And if uh, we're on call for consults, then it's seeing new consults in the hospital. And that might be anywhere from the emergency room to the critical care uh, uh, unit to the um, regular inpatient floor. So it's uh, an early day that, that is busy all day long. Uh, and things start to settle down around 5 o'clock or so. Uh, and then it's wrapping up and uh, trying to get home to see the family. Lila, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, um, I was going to say that I, I feel like medical training at least is very much characterized in phases. And so your your day um, or how your typical day looks like will, will look very different depending on the phases. Um, and I was trying to figure out what like the key distinguishing factors between the phases are. And I think it is um, kind of like being in patient care. And so before kind of your last two years of medical school and then going on to residency, um, I would say my time has been like fairly flexible. Like there's a certain amount of studying that I need to do, but it's kind of like on my own time. So I would um, like go to class, um, attend lectures, things like that. But most of the day would be kind of for me to design when I want to study and uh, when I want to do free stuff. Um, and that's sort of the same way in, in, um, in the PhD as well. Um, but then once you start uh, going into the hospital and uh, participating in clinical care, that's when your, uh, your time is uh, much more structured. Uh, and then it really depends on kind of what your team needs from you, what kind of medical student responsibilities you have, um, and that'll dictate when you have to like be in the hospital or be in the clinic and um, when you get to go home. Thank you so much for all of your answers. It seems like time management plays like a key role in all of this. And so, you know, as doctors, I feel like, and as aspiring doctors, I feel like having good time management skills are like an absolute must. And so uh, based on these answers, you know, I feel like I should probably improve on my time management skills as well, considering the fact that, you know, um, being able to balance your work life and your social life is definitely a key factor in becoming a doctor. Thank you guys for all of your answers. Um, for the next question, this is mostly towards Dr. Lin and Dr. Weigold. Um, many students were curious about how you chose your specialty and how you knew it was right for you, and also what your specialty entails in terms of the patients you see. Okay, so I'll start. Um, when I went to medical school, keep in mind I was fairly young um, because I did the combined bachelor and MB program, so I was only two years 20 uh, when I went to medical school. So when I went to medical school, I was sure, I mean, 100% positive I was going to be a pediatrician because I love children. <laughs> well, then I, then after, so medical school for me did, uh, consists of two years of sort of, I say, book learning. So you go to classes um, and take the exams. Um, and then the second two years was clinical rotations. So I went around seeing the different specialties. So there are certain ones you have to do, pediatrics, family medicine, um, et cetera. So you go through all of those. So when I went through my pediatrics rotation, I was very excited. I said, this is what I want to do. Well, during my pediatric rotation, we had to do NICU. So neonative intensive care unit. That's when I realized I couldn't be a pediatrician. Um, 
because pediatricians have to deal with very, very sick children. And every day I would go home, I would be so sad and upset and cry because I couldn't deal with really sick kids and having them sort of not do well. So then I said, well, I got to come up with something else. So my father was very wise. And he says to me, either you can be a cardiologist or you can be a neurologist. So I said, okay, I'm going to look into those two possibilities. I did cardiology rotation my first. And I realized I didn't like cardiac catheterization because that was a lot of radiation. Um, so I said, maybe, maybe not that. Then I did neurology. I absolutely fell in love with neurology. Um, neurology for me is a lot of sort of problem solving. Everyone is different. There's a lot of unknown about neurology and neurological diseases and a lot of different treatments. So every day when I see a patient, a new patient, they walk in, it's like a brand new problem, a brand new puzzle for me. And I love puzzles. So it's like solving their problem gives me satisfaction. So I said, neurology is what I want to do. And that's why I picked it as a specialty. Great. Okay. I guess I'll go ahead next. Uh, that's great. Uh, you know, th th I think the stories are kind of similar. Um, uh, it's, it's actually, and, and I think most people that are here are at a very, very early stage. If they're in high school or maybe they're just starting college, so there's still a, a ways to go before they have to make any decision about um, what specialty they would actually choose. Um, and there's such a wide range of approaches that, that I saw, for example, when I was in medical school, uh, some of my peers um, knew exactly what they wanted to do on day one of medical school, and they went through medical school, and then they graduated and they went on to additional training, and, and that's what they did, you know, and so they just they absolutely were uh, very sure and, and they stuck with that and, and that's what they did. And many, I think that's actually the exception rather than a rule. I think most people kind of like Dr. Lin uh, and myself sort of had to kind of feel around and navigate uh, to, to try to decide what they, what they wanted to do. When I, uh, um, prior to going into medical school, I had done some, a uh, little bit of volunteer work uh, with uh, the mentally ill and uh, I, and I thought that uh, those cases, um, you know, were really intriguing, uh, a little heartbreaking, um, and, and uh, made me feel like I, I really wanted to go into psychiatry, especially to try to um, do something about schizophrenia. Um, actually, I was really interested in the neurobiology of schizophrenia um, and some of the um, things that I saw just in terms of imaging for, for that kind of problem. Uh, so when I started medical school, I thought I wanted to be a psychiatrist, and I still think it's a fascinating field. Um, but then I also started to learn about physiology and um, uh, the way the body works, and cardiology became, became you know, became uh, an interesting area for me. Um, I did a psych rotation as one of my first rotations uh, in third year of medical school, and it was a disaster. Uh, because it was an inpatient psych unit with the sickest of the sick, the most kind of treatment resistant um, schizophrenics. And unfortunately, a psychiatrist who was the attending of the unit, who I think was kind of a burned out uh, psychiatrist who was basically just kind of prescribing medications and, and, uh, and wasn't really doing much else. And I had thought of psychiatry as, as psychoanalysis and all of the different kind of interesting cognitive behavioral um, approaches that could be taken. So I didn't see any of that. And it was, a, it really turned me off. And around the same time, I, I had this interest in cardiology. So I, I pursued that. And that's how I ended up choosing cardiology. I, I think that um, the, 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 the lesson and a little bit of a warning that's there is it's, it's not easy to try to decide what you want to do. It's really helpful if you have family members and people that you can talk to that can kind of help you with this, because just trying to do it on your own the first time, um, uh, it's it's hard to know what what you're getting into exactly. But also, I would say, just be careful about single experiences. You know, a single rotation or a single person. 
and, and putting too much emphasis on that experience or that person as if they completely define the, the field and the specialty. It's really not the case. Uh, what I saw of psychiatry was just one little sliver of the whole world of psychiatry, you know, and there's a lot of different uh, other ways to practice psychiatry rather than, you know, an inpatient, you know, um, unit like that. So it's very, very important, I think, just to keep a broad mind and try to gather as much experience as you possibly can from different people and different experiences uh, as you go through, as you go through. Um, thank you all for your answers. I think it's really interesting how you guys all start out with different plans in mind for your career and how you guys are doing completely different things than you guys expected. Um, it really shows how there's always time to change your career path and that like it takes time to realize like what you really want to do in the future. Um, I'll pass it on to Sari for the next question. Okay, so the next question is actually, yeah, targeted more towards Lila. And so the question is, why did you decide to pursue an MD PhD? And um, what are the pros and cons of pursuing an MD PhD in your opinion? And what are your plans after getting your MD PhD? Are you thinking more about um, staying in the more uh, practice? Are you focused on practicing medicine or more on the teaching side of medicine? And uh, lastly, this is the last part of the question. Are you thinking about residency? And if so, are there any specialties in mind? Okay, I think I might uh, eventually need a couple of reminders on all of the parts of the question, but I'll, I'll try to do my best to remember um, all of the components. Um, yeah, so I think my my road to deciding on an MD-PhD was um, fairly non-standard, as I think most MD-PhDs are. Um, as I mentioned, I came into college thinking I might be interested in medicine. Um, I was very interested in biology um, in high school. Um, I was very interested in learning about how the body works. Um, and then in college, I was surrounded by a lot of people who um, were very passionate about engineering and like it kind of um, permeated into my thinking. I really was excited by the things that they got excited by. Um, I had not been exposed to engineering at all as a high school student. And so I took a couple of engineering classes and really, really liked them. I started doing research in um, bioengineering and really enjoyed that. And um, around like sophomore year, I decided I was going to do a PhD in bioengineering and kind of go in that direction. Um, and then as I continued to do research in college, um, I was really excited by the questions that we were asking. It was very cutting edge stuff. Um, but for me, um, it seemed that a lot of the questions that we were asking were very much motivated by, um, oh, can we do something that is super cool just because it's super cool? Um, and I found myself kind of questioning what the kind of long-term long applications or directions or like, how is this gonna benefit people at the end? Um, I uh, interacted with a couple of uh, MD PhDs that were at my university and um, really liked how they thought about research questions, um, how their research questions were clinically motivated um, and how they were framed in a way that was kind of uh, targeted at asking a question that was relevant to um, improving patient care in the future. Um, and I think that very, very much resonated with um, how like I wanted to, to kind of frame my career and, and pursue my interests moving forward. And so that's kind of how I ended up uh, deciding on MD-PhD. Um, I had a couple of really great um, kind of peer mentors who were either like um, like one or two years uh, ahead of me in, um, in college or maybe a few, a few years ahead of that. Um, and they were very much kind of strong supporters of me and, and helped me kind of solidify my decision. So that's kind of my plug to, to find not only mentors that are much older than you, but um, who are already doing what you think you might wanna do, but also people who are like closer to you in stage. Um, I ended up taking a gap year after college where I continued to do research and applied to, um, to MD PhD programs. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of how I, I got into that. Um, what was the second part of uh, your question? Actually, this might be three parts. So the second part is, are you currently, are you more uh, focused on pursuing, or are you currently thinking about focusing on pursuing research or uh, practicing medicine at like a hospital? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm still fairly early on. I still haven't done any of my like clinical uh, rotations or anything like that. So um, I'm definitely waiting for those to, to figure it out. 
Um, right now, uh, I, I think I'm definitely going to do residency in a specialty. I haven't decided which one. Um, but in terms of kind of a, a quote unquote physician scientist career, I think there are a lot of considerations that go into that. I think it can be very demanding on your time, especially in the early stages. So that is definitely a consideration, um, kind of balancing, making sure you're um, developing all this, the clinical skills you need to be a good clinician who can like effectively take care of patients and also kind of staying on top of um, all of the, the new science, all of the like uh, advances that are happening very fast in your field um, kind of may or may not leave a lot, a lot of um, time and room for, for much else in your life, especially in the beginning. So that is definitely a consideration that you kind of want to take into account when, when making a decision about whether or not you want to um, continue in kind of basic science research and practice medicine. Um, there are a lot of other things that you can do with a with an MD PhD degree. Like the, those aren't the two options. Um, a lot of the things that you can do with an MD degree or a PhD degree, those are very much still open to you. So um, the the kind of typical things that people go into as MD PhDs are not kind of the only things that they go into. So definitely, if you're interested in this career path, um, make sure to explore all of your options. Yeah, thank you, Lila. I think that answered the third part of the question, which is about which subspecialty, but I guess that's a little, you know, like you're kind of choosing right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm still, yeah, I'm still pretty open. Yeah, again, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of time to choose your subspecialties. And of course, there are lots of pros and cons. And um, it seems like it's about choosing um, or finding your right interest, the right interest that suit you and finding the right path for you. So yeah, thank you so much for your answer. Um... Okay, so I believe, yes, we will continue with the RSVP questions just because we have a little bit, uh, we have six more minutes left um, for the RSVP questions. And so Anaga, let's ask the last question. Okay, um, another popular question was, what do you wish you knew before going into medicine? In other words, were there any aspects of the training or actually being an attending physician that surprised you? That's a, that's a hard question. That's a hard question. What did I wish I knew? Um, I think I wish I knew how much I would say non-patient care things were there. Um, so things like I didn't know all these things about reimbursement, uh, insurance, authorizations, uh, things that I would say related to patient care, but not necessarily medicine. So I would say it's like paperwork. Um, some of these things take a lot of time to do, but that's, I mean, we have to do it because it's part of caring for patients. So I guess I didn't sort of know about that. Um, I also didn't know how to like run a business. Uh, for instance, when you're training or going through medical school, you're with a hospital, you're with an institution. Um, so you never had to do your own uh, billing of insurance. Uh, you didn't have to do a lot of the paperwork to get things for patients. So I guess I, was, I, did, I wasn't exposed to that. But then when you're out in practice, that's very different. There's paperwork for lots of different things. Um, so I think I didn't know about the amount of paperwork. But otherwise, I, like I said, enjoy taking care of patients. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, um, I think I, I wish I knew more about uh, and had learned more about the business side of practicing medicine, um, just because it would be helpful to understand the larger picture uh, of the, the factors that influence uh, the, the process of delivering healthcare to patients. Uh, it's more than just knowing the, you know, the right type of treatment or medicine or you know, how to treat the, the, the medical problem. Um, there's, there's a lot more to it than that. And there's a, there's a larger kind of you know, economic uh, and business structure around the delivery of healthcare. And I, and I think it's, um, I almost wish that it were sort of part of the curriculum in some way. Uh, that's probably not going to happen because the medical uh, med school curriculum is already 
stressed and burdened with just the sheer medical and biological information that, that everybody has to learn. So trying to you know cram more into it, uh, probably not gonna happen. But um, if there's, I guess a piece of advice would be if there's some way that, that people can try to learn a little something about just the business aspect, um, you know, to do that. The other similar kind of corollary to that is in terms of choosing a specialty. Uh, I mean, if you kind of just face the facts and the reality, there, there's a business element to that as well. Uh, for example, um, the field of cardiac surgery, uh, you know, is is not today what it used to be in the past. Uh, it's facing a lot of competition, frankly, from cardiology uh, and a lot of uh, procedures that um, traditionally were done by cardiac surgeons in the past are done now with catheters and, and uh, percutaneous interventions. So you gotta, I think you would, when you're trying to decide on, on a specialty, and this is a long way off for you guys, but think about also just the the broader picture, you know, of course, it's important to, to do what you love and what interests you, uh, but you should at least take a peek at the broader kind of business and economic picture and landscape of that specialty um, to make a really fully informed, you know, decision about what career path to choose. Um, I think kind of going off of that, um, I think one of the the things I didn't really think about at all until coming to medical school is how I think in, in medicine, we kind of have this tendency of viewing um, health problems as these like biological problems. If we just understand the physiology and um, the, the biology of the problem, we'll be able to solve it eventually. Um, I think coming to medical school and through the limited patient experience that I've, I've had, um, it's uh, the, all the other social and, and structural things that come into play when a patient comes into your clinic with a problem, a health problem, um, may sometimes outweigh like the actual biology and the physiology of the thing that you're trying to treat. And it may be um, more important to kind of address those social, economic, and structural problems as a way of, of trying to treat their, their health problems. And, and so in a lot of, uh, of teams that I've, I've worked with in, um, in clinic, um, they'll have a team of like a social worker um, that may help the, the patient kind of navigate the healthcare system if they don't have uh, a ton of uh, like health literacy. Um, and uh, they'll have a pharmacist that may help patients who might have limited kind of economic means to like figure out how to get the medication that they need. Um, and all this other stuff that kind of goes beyond the exact biological and medical treatment for whatever condition they might have. And so I think before coming to medical school and before kind of having some clinical um, experiences, I think that kind of aspect of medicine wasn't really emphasized in any of my, um, my coursework or, or in the curriculum. Yeah, um, there's definitely a lot of bureaucracy and red tape that comes along with being a doctor, especially in private practice, but also in the hospital. I think it's really important for students to know about the social factors and the economic factors that go into going into the medical field before they finally make their decision. But yeah, um, I'll be passing it on to Sari to talk about the live questions now. Yeah, and it was really cool to hear about the holistic approach of medicine, just because I feel like that's like a, like a shift in the way medicine was before. And so, yeah, it's really cool how there's like this like biopsychosocial approach that's um, incorporated into the medical field now. Yeah, so thank you guys so much for your answers. And now that we've answered some questions from the RSVP form, we wanna open up to you guys now. So please feel free to raise your hand using the Zoom feature um, if you want, or yeah, and uh, unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can also drop your questions in the chat and we will try to get our, or do our best to get through all of them. And so if anyone has any questions, please don't be shy um, and yes, please, either put it in the chat or you can feel free to unmute yourself. Um, yeah, so I guess this question is more towards uh, Lila. So I think you said that you did not grow up in the States and you only moved there for university. So right now I'm in the process of uh, studying my university applications and I'm also interested in pursuing medicine. And I was just wondering if you found it difficult to go to university in the States and pursue medicine as an international student, 
because personally I think it's like uh, for some reason I feel like it might not be worth it it might be more difficult so currently I'm looking at Asian universities but the teachers at my school are telling me to like not give up on that idea and are actually like trying to push me to apply to the states but then I really don't know because all my teachers are from the states so I feel like it's a bit biased so I was just wondering what you have to say about that yeah, um, that's a really good question. I will uh, preface this with um, I uh, like coming before coming to the US, I had a US citizenship. So that made things a lot more easy, um, especially because I was able to uh, like apply for financial aid for university. Um, and then um, a lot of MD PhD programs are um, like fund your tuition. And so um, the the other thing with being a, a U.S. citizen is that you are eligible for certain um, medical school loans that international students might not be eligible for, um, which is kind of uh, a feature of the system that is isn't the the best. So I think that um, has definitely influenced my decision to pursue medicine here, um, especially because I didn't have to take out any um, significant amount of loans to come to medical school. Um, I think if that had not been the case, I would have very, very, very strongly considered not doing it. Um, and yeah, I think it, it really depends on, on kind of how much support you have from your family, your potential spouse in the future, um, what other demands on your time and income you might have. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely a tough decision if, um, yeah, um, honestly, either way. <laughs> Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Um, I have a oh, sorry. No, Annie. Annie, go. Hey, um, I have a question for mostly Dr. Weigold and Dr. Lin. Um, what are some of the advances and developments that you hope to see in the future of both uh, cardiology and neurology in the near future? Uh, okay, I'll start with this one, Dr. Lin. Um, well, uh, there's still a lot of unknowns, uh, like in all the fields. Uh, a big um, problem within cardiology is heart failure. Um, and uh, what we call cardiomyopathy, which is essentially just a heart that doesn't squeeze and pump the way that it should. Um, and right now we have some good uh, medicines for that. But uh, uh, I, my hope is that we can start to um, really learn more about problems like that at the molecular level and at the genetic level uh, so that we can understand um, what it is uh, at that level and, and individually within individual patients uh, uh, that's uh, the pathophysiology uh, that's producing the problem and then target that with uh, you know, new forms of medicines rather than just simple molecules that kind of uh, bathe the whole entire uh, body in a, in a drug response. We could target uh, perhaps monoclonal antibodies uh, and, and more specific targets. So I really think the future is going to be at the, in terms of uh, more molecular and specific and targeted uh, medicines for cardiovascular problems. So for, for neurology, I can say that since even, you know, finishing medical school and residency, there's a huge sort of advances in treatment options for various neurological diseases. However, as a practicing neurologist, I think one of the most frustrating part is dealing with dementia, things like Alzheimer's, or we call them neurodegenerative diseases things like Parkinson's. Um, these are conditions that continue to get worse with time. Now we have medicines, but they have very limited efficacy in how well they treat the problem. So it's really, we can only slow things down, we can treat symptoms, but we really have no cure and we don't even have medication to stop progression. So my hope for the future, or what I really, really like to see it's something that can sort of stop a degeneration process or something that can reverse a degenerative disease, especially in things like dementia and Parkinson's. And I'm hoping that the science is there and they're working on it. 
Yeah, super interesting. Thank you so much. My question kind of um, is in the same field um, with advancements. Uh, as a practicing physician, how do you handle the rapid advancements in medicine? In such a fast paced field, does it become overwhelming? And if it does, how do you handle that? How do you change your practice or adjust in a way that fits such a fast moving career? Um, you, you, you do the best you can. Uh, uh, the volume of uh, new research uh, is, is large and uh, continues to grow, it seems, every year. Uh, and the pace of, of advancements also continues to, 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 uh, to quicken. So, uh, you know, uh, I think at one point, people may have the conception that they're going to go to medical school and then they're training and then they're going to just practice and they're gonna know everything that they need to know and then they're gonna practice medicine. Uh, but it really is, a, a, um, I think like a lot of jobs and careers, it's, it's one that requires you to continually learn and, and keep up with new learning and new advancements. So you read the journals, you attend the meetings, uh, you do as much as you can to try to uh, keep up with it. Um, uh, the delivery of the actual innovative uh, approaches, again, is uh, dependent upon not just having the knowledge and knowing how to prescribe medicine or, or perform a procedure, but again, that, that's linked in with the larger picture of the economics, um, the healthcare delivery systems. Uh, and so you do also have to you know, learn about that as well and keep up with the developments and the changes uh, in the in the economics and in the, in the business uh, uh, structures as well. For example, there's a very large um, pharmaceutical uh, delivery uh, system that decided uh, to stop uh, providing um, coverage, insurance coverage and, and co-payments or payments for a particular anticoagulant that was very uh, commonly used for a lot of people with atrial fibrillation to prevent stroke. Um, so suddenly patients were showing up in clinic and saying, I've been taking this medicine for years. And all of a sudden I went to the pharmacy to pick it up and they told me that my insurance doesn't pay for it anymore. And now it's going to cost me $500 to pick up a month, one month supply of this medicine. So that's just an example of how, you know, it's, it's a, there's more to it than just knowing the biology. Uh, and you just do the best you can to, to keep up with things. Um, and, and it's a team approach. So you know, you work with your partners. Here in our clinic, we have a, a nurse practitioner who, who really specializes in, in, in keeping up, especially with all the ins and outs of the coverage requirements and the pre-authorizations for medicines. So, you know, you work together with, with, your, um, with your, your, uh, your leadership and your, your other peers to, uh, to tackle it. Uh, I totally agree with our Weingold. So in medicine, uh, to stay licensed and board certified, there are certain requirements you have to meet. So we call it continue medical education. So even when you, after you finish, you're continuing really learning about new medications, new, new diseases, uh, new diagnoses, uh, new testing, uh, diagnostics. So I think sort of keeping an open mind, realize that medicine is about lifelong learning uh, that there's always going to be something new, something exciting. Uh, and I, that's all, you know, we do read journals, get your credits <laughs> and also attend meetings, talking with your colleagues, sharing information. For instance, in my practice, um, twice a month, the physicians will all meet and we will go over interesting cases that we have. So we learn from each other and we learn education credits that way. So I think you just have to realize that medicine is constantly changing and new knowledge is being created and you just have to be willing to be a lifelong learner. Thank you so much for all of your answers. Yeah, I love the lifelong learning aspect of that. I think that's really, really important. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Lila who had a question about, I believe, academia versus uh, private practice, I believe. Yes, go ahead, Lila. Yeah, that was basically my question. I, I was curious to ask Dr. Weigold um, what his experience was in, in academic medicine versus um, private practice. 
All right. So uh, first, we have to define the term academic medicine. Um, so it's all academic, uh, you know, in a way, um, because like we just said, we all have to continually learn lifelong the new advances. So uh, even somebody that's uh, strictly doing private practice, uh, seeing patients in the office, in the hospital, still has to uh, be an academic physician as, as far as their learning, sharing uh, uh, with other physicians uh, and colleagues. I think the when people talk about academic medicine, usually what they're referring to is physicians that are engaged in research. Uh, research, as you know, you know, uh, but for everybody, research is a whole nother uh, endeavor. Uh, it's a whole nother skill set. Uh, it, it requires a, a different uh, team of different um, other uh, players uh, who have their own skill sets and their own knowledge. Uh, there's a whole other structure that's involved because you have to, you're dealing with, um, usually with a, with a company that's sponsoring the research uh, of some sort. And there are contracts, negotiations, and, and a whole, again, business side to the, the aspect of doing research. So academic physicians uh, are engaged in that whole process. Um, so it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's a whole nother sort of world. And that academic aspect, again, there's different kinds of research because there's basic science research uh, and there's clinical medical research. Um, MD-PhDs are especially well suited to be the, the, the physician, uh, cl you know, clinical scientist who can spearhead uh, uh, a clinical research investigation, you know, for a new drug or a new device um, uh, that's usually not developed by the physician. You know, the days of the physicians in a, you know, lab in their, in their, uh, basement or something or their garage are, are long gone. And, and of course, new drug development and device development is done by, by uh, biomedical corporations and pharmaceutical corporations, but they need physicians to uh, uh, enroll patients uh, to test the drugs and the devices. So um, uh, that's, that's the world of um, academics in terms of research. There's another aspect of academic uh, medicine, which is the teaching and education. And again, a person in private practice can certainly teach medical students and fellows uh, and residents, um, but, but academic uh, medicine from the teaching aspect usually refers to institutions that, are, that carry the responsibility of teaching and training up the next generation of physicians. Um, it's, it's another skill set, again. Uh, it's another type of activity. Um, and, and, and there's some overlap because um, uh, physicians who are engaged in research are usually at the institutions that also do the teaching. Uh, so that's, that's that sort of a world uh, versus a purely private practice world where the, the flurry of activity during the day consists of delivering healthcare to patients and providing the services to patients and to, and to colleagues. Uh, and referring physicians. There's not a lot of time there for teaching or you know, conducting research. Um, so it really comes down to just how the time is, how the time is split. Um, both of them, I think, are, are fantastic, wonderful, and can be very fulfilling and satisfying career choices. Um, so people, again, who are young and trying to you know, come up uh, into this process will need to decide in a way, which way they want to go. Um, uh, so again, it's not that if you're in private practice, you, you can't be academic or you can't do any teaching. You can do some. It's just there's not a lot of time for it. If you really want to devote a lot of your time and energy to research and teaching, then uh, you, you, know, you would want to pursue an academic uh, medical career. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say is just uh, I'm always wary of Kind of a little bit of a when you people come up through training institutions of course they're in the academic medicine world and there's sometimes a little bit of a bias against private practice uh like well you know all they do is see patients and take care of patients you know that's not really like the full picture of medicine and i and i would say just if you hear that or or get a sense of that from somebody just take that with a big grain of salt because it's um you know there, 
you're you're doing a lot when you are when you're providing care for patients, and it's and it's um it's not that it's somehow lesser uh, uh, or less academic. It's it's very academic as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Weigold. Okay, so we're running out of time, but um, Lila, could you perhaps uh, answer the question that was uh, posted in the chat by, I believe, Kamora, I believe. Uh, she, yeah, it was more about research and uh, the question was more about like uh, your MD-PhD. And so, yeah, if, if you can answer that in the chat, that'd be really great. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, um, so the question is, um, how do you define research and what does it really entail? Um, I think that's kind of a tough question to answer. It really depends on your field. I be very vague in general about it. I think it's just the, the um, endeavor of, of gaining new knowledge about a, a question that, um, that don't, didn't exist before. And so that'll look very different depending on what the, the field is and what the question is um that you're you're interested in in asking um and so if um the rest of the question uh says is it more of a numerical computational approach uh and analyzing other scholarly literature um drawing inferences and conclusions in your field of study i think it can be all in any of those um yeah, I think when you're kind of starting off with a new question, you you have to do a lot of um, research on on um, what already exists or what is currently known, and that involves a lot of reading, um, a lot of analyzing what um, uh, other studies have already been performed, and then um, if your question requires you to collect data and analyze it, then it'll involve um, some amount of numerical computational approaches, depending on the data that you have. Um, and then drawing inferences and conclusions in your in your field, what that exactly looks like um, will, will depend on the kind of data you've gathered, um, the kind of question you, you want to, to answer. It's not a very concrete answer to your question, but I, yeah, I think the, the, the TLDR is that it, it really depends on um, your field and your question. So we might go a little over time, but um, panelists, would that be okay with you? I believe we'll make sure to wrap up by 10 or sorry, 9.15 uh, Eastern time. Would that be all right? Sure. I think it's 10.15, but yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 10.15. No worries. Yeah, we'll go a little bit over time just because we have such wonderful questions coming yeah, in. Yeah, and amazing answers too. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so let's, Chloe had a question. Uh, she asks, uh, Dr. Weigel talked about a doctor who became burnt out. Do you think that this could happen over time due to the emotional toll of becoming a doctor or some other factors? Uh, I mean, it can happen. Uh, it can happen to anybody in any field. I mean, I think you could be a, a banker or a florist and get burnt out. Um, so, um, I, you know, again, it's just, it's important to avoid that. It's important just to try to find that balance between your work and the rest of your life. And, and that's true, you know, for, for anybody, you know, pursuing any career. Um, I don't think it happens too much, but, um, but it certainly can happen. Thank you so much. So I, just, sorry, I, I just want to add, burnout is a sort of topic, a problem in, me in medicine. But of course, I agree with Dr. Weinberg that it can happen in any career path. Um, but I think it's more likely uh, for physicians to burn out um, for the following reasons. Um, you know, you only, we only all have 24 hours in a day um, and we all have to choose how to take our time. So priorities are different for various people. I think when there's a conflict in the priorities, uh, like they'll sort of drain on your time, uh, and then you, so that's part of it. So like, as a mother, I, you know, I gotta do certain things with my kids, but I gotta go to work, I gotta take care, care of patients. Um, so being able to find the balance, being able to kind of prioritize is important. Um, the other reason for burnout, I think, is that I guess in a way we don't know how to relieve that pressure. Um, so you have to find a way to say, okay, I'm getting burned out because whatever reason it may be, like how do I sort of ease 
that pressure on myself um, by either asking for help. Because one of the things I found that I had trouble with is, you know, I did everything on my own. I went to medical school, I did residency, I, I could take care of anything, right? Well, yes, but no. Um, I was sort of afraid or ashamed to ask for help. Um, and when I said to myself, it's, hey, I'm doing about a thousand things. I need help. And if I can ask for it, that relieves the pressure and I'm less likely to burn out. So I think for me, that was the big problem. I didn't ask for help when I should have or early. So I think you have to figure out what is causing you to feel sort of burned out and address the issue early on so it doesn't affect your personal life or your career. I think that's really good advice from Dr. Lin, uh, very well put uh, and emphasizes again, uh, especially in medicine, uh, success is achieved when you work as a team. Um, you know, in a lot of different ways, this, and this is just another example, uh, you know, sometimes you need to reach out to other people for help. Um, uh, so the, the teamwork aspect of medicine is, is very important to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that answered Christina's question about um, avoiding uh, becoming burnt out, but are there any last points to add on to maybe like things that you do uh, maybe taking a break, like what you do on weekends to help you with um, avoiding being burnt out? Um, I'll add uh, a couple of things. I think finding kind of your people is really important, whether that's within medicine. So other, um, I guess for me, other med students um, who kind of share my experience um, and also people outside of medicine that can kind of give you perspective on, um, yeah, you might feel like, um, it's very important for you to do all of these things to be like the best medical student to like get the best you know, test scores or whatever, but there really is life outside of medicine. Um, and I feel like my, uh, my friends and family outside of medicine um, kind of fulfill that role for me. And, and that has been um, very kind of vital for, for me to, you know, keep going and, um, and kind of surmount the challenges and obstacles that I've faced. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll wrap up with last two questions from me and Eileen. And so my question is, um, I believe this question was asked to you, um, Lila, during your interview. And I um, am also a big fan of Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, and I absolutely love The Emperor of All Maladies. But do any of you guys have any book recommendations or podcast recommendations? And if so, um, please give me some because I've been craving some really good like medical healthcare books. And so um, what recommendations do you guys have? Well, all the podcasts I listen to are just, you know, cardiology podcasts. I don't think they would be, I don't know if they would be very interesting uh, uh, for you. They get into all the technical, you know, just the weeds and, and details about the latest research. Uh, but, but um, you know, I think podcasts in general are very, are very useful. Uh, usually I'm listening to them as I'm driving in the car, you know, back and forth. Um, and they are a good way to, uh, you know, to get some extra uh, information or some, some other insights. What is the name of the podcast that, the very cardiology-esque podcast, I want to give it a listen and I want to see like, to what extent can I understand like the content that's being talked about? Uh, there's a, there's a good, um, there's a, there's a, a cardiologist who puts a weekly, puts out a weekly podcast called This Week in Cardiology, uh, and it comes out every Friday, and there's also a website that goes with it, and he covers um, just the latest uh, publications and research uh, that's come out in the preceding week, and he does a good job of putting it in, in, in perspective and context. He does a little bit of um, kind of um, uh, critique uh, at a statistical level, um, at a, at a research design level. So it's, it's good. Um, so this week in cardiology, so you could, you could check that one out. Thank you so much. I'll try my best to understand as much as I can. Dr. Lin and Lila, do you guys have any book recommendations or podcast recommendations? Yeah. Um, I think as you mentioned, uh, the emperor of, of all maladies is, um, one book that I really, really enjoyed. I read that in college, um, and it kind of goes through the history of cancer treatment from 
like the ancient times to now and it really kind of gives you a very um, bird's eye wide perspective on how cancer management and treatment has changed and kind of scientific progress and how it happens um, incrementally. A book that I recently read that has really changed my perspective on a lot of um, uh, the way that kind of medicine works is called Inflamed. Um, it's fairly recent. Uh, let me look up the, the authors are Raj Patel and Rupa Maria. And it kind of goes back to um, one of my previous points about all of the other things that are um, involved um, and influence people's health, uh, health in general. Um, so it talks a lot about um, environmental factors that go into influencing people's health, uh, social factors, um, historical factors, things like that. Um, and I, yeah, I, I found that kind of perspective really uh, illuminating. Wait, sorry. Sorry. I must be the only one that doesn't do any more podcasts or anything else outside of journal, like reading journals. So I hardly ever read any journals. But what I usually do is if I have a question that sort of, I, you know, I go on the website, search for a knowledge that I need about something, and I use something called up to date quite a bit. Um, so they are sort of people summarizing certain medical information that if I need it quickly and to look for an update, that's what I do. Uh, that's really sort of not, yeah, up to date, that's right. And it's really not sort of a, a journal or a podcast. I try to like not do any more medical stuff than I have to when I leave work. <laughs> so the podcasts or things I listen to are usually not medical related. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all of the recommendations. Um, we'll wrap up with one last question from Eileen. Awesome, thanks, sorry. Hate to take too much of your time, but I did want to ask, um, kind of tying it back, Dr. Wanga was talking about earlier with teamwork and medicine. Um, I was hoping you guys could kind of speak on like the importance of collaboration in medicine, because I feel like when you think of medicine initially, you might think of like physicians and physicians in training, but there are also so many like nurses, techs, and mid-level practitioners, um, and so many others who are also part of this healthcare team. I mean, I'm also curious about like collaboration across specialties because I feel like it's easy sometimes to hyper focus on like your specialty and their pathology and kind of have that tunnel vision, but that can kind of be harmful for the patient in the long run. Go ahead, Dr. Lin. So um, there's quite a bit of collaboration, at least um, with with the different specialties, because you have to think about the fact that patients are 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 multiple systems. They're not just one thing. They have the, there's the heart, there's the brain, there's the kidneys, there's everything else. So there's quite a bit of, you know, that's what I, I always say, that's why I send pay, you know, notes to cardiologists, primary care. So they, they all know what I'm thinking. And then, you know, sometimes there's a complicated patient. I pick up the phone, I call up the subspecialty in question. Um, cardiology, neurology do a lot of collaboration strokes a lot of cardiac things affect neurological illness and all medication can have potential interactions. So that's one sort of collaboration. So collaboration among physicians. And of course, you know, we need nurses, we need secretaries to help us with, you know, doing paperwork, uh, calling patients back. Um, so other things, and, you know, we need physical therapists to help do therapy on patients with certain neurological diseases. So there's a lot of collaboration among all of us. And I have to say that I couldn't do without my physician's assistant because she helps me take care of a lot of my follow-up patients and then we work together. So it's always, it's always a teamwork approach for everything. And like I said, the patient is many different systems in one person. So it's very important to collaborate and be able to discuss things with other specialties, specialists, primary care providers, or nurses, or physician's assistants. Yeah, 100% agree. Uh, it's, it's absolutely a teamwork approach. Uh, like a lot of other uh, jobs, uh, you know, you got to work with um, other people uh, who have their own skill set and, uh, and their own um, insights. So, 
but I would say that even starts uh, before you're practicing medicine. I mean, as you're even in uh, medical school, uh, it helps to you know study with other people and to collaborate. You know, uh, trade notes and um, you know compare notes and uh, and work together to to tackle that. Uh, task of just learning the material. Uh, and then when you're on rotations, you're working, you know, with your colleagues and with and with the other team members. So uh, uh, especially in medicine, it's 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 very much a team, a team approach. And that's what's uh, going to be success, bring success, success defined as the improvement in the health uh, outcomes for the patient. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, the only thing I'll add is kind of what my perspective as a, as a medical student is. Um, I think one of my favorite clinical experiences I've had so far is um, attending something that's called a tumor board. And so um, the, the way that that works is that if you um, are an oncologist or you uh, treat patients with cancer, um, all of the different physicians of the different specialties that are treating a particular patient, um, and then all of the other healthcare team members kind of gather in a room and discuss the patient's treatment plan. And so you have the oncologist, um, the, the surgeon who may have operated um, on the patient, um, the radiologist who may have done the imaging to kind of figure out where the tumor is, um, uh, often a geneticist who's familiar with the genetics of the, of the cancer that the patient might have, um, the nurses who are involved in, with the patient's care, um, all of these different people with all these different um, areas of expertise kind of gather in a room and discuss the particular um, patient's case and how to kind of best pro proceed with their management and care. And it's really all of these patients, all of these people with different experience, ex expertise um, areas kind of bouncing ideas off of each other, discussing this complex patient um, and kind of um, coming to a consensus on how to best um, treat the, the patient. Um, and that was kind of one of the best examples of how medicine can be a, a team, a, a team effort. Yeah, thank you so much for your answers. Loved hearing your different perspectives and collaboration is definitely critical in all of these stages. Yeah, I'll pass it on to Anaga to wrap up since we are nearing the end of the event. Um, yeah, thank you to the audience member for all of your questions. Um, I'm actually going to pass it on to Sari to conclude. Yeah, so we wanted to wrap up today's event with a Zoom screenshot. And so this was this is like our way to remember um, who kind of like showed up and um, the number of participants we got. And so um, if you'd like to, please turn on your camera and um, we'll take a couple of photos to get the best shot and fix up your hair in the meantime. Um, try to look your best and we'll take one really or two to three uh, really nice Zoom pictures, which we will use in our Instagram recap post. And if you um, respond to it in the section of the RSVP form where you put your Instagram handle, we'll make sure that you'll be tagged. And so, um, yeah. Uh, please give me a couple of minutes. Okay, is everyone ready? Okay, we'll take the photo in three. Okay. Okay, let's, is everyone ready to go? Okay, perfect. Uh, we'll take the photo in three, two, one. One more, three, two, one. Perfect, okay. We've got two screenshots, hopefully that's enough. Um, okay, and I'll pass it back to um, Anaga who will be fully wrapping up this event. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, um, please type your Instagram handle down in the chat if you didn't already. Um, but if you let us know in the RSVP form, you guys will already be tagged in the post. Um, I'll be passing it on to Annie to talk about how to contact the panelists. Yeah, so here um, we're just sharing the contact information of our panelists uh, for any questions that we couldn't get to today. So feel free to take a screenshot of this slide. And if you have any additional questions that you'd like to ask our three panelists, um, feel free to reach out to them. I'll just stay here for a few seconds. All right. And lastly, we will end with Eileen, who will talk more about how you can get involved with STEM to the Sky. Great. Thanks, Annie. 
So there are a lot of ways to get involved with STEM to the Sky. So on the screen here, we have all of our social media platforms. So make sure to follow us on there. It's just at STEM to the Sky for each platform. Um, and then we also have our interviews on our website, which you can always check out. And if you're interested in joining our mailing list, it's actually a little bit hard to find right now, but we're currently revamping the website, so it'll be easier to in the future. But you can scroll down um, to the bottom of our website to join our mailing list, or you can actually just put your email right in the chat so we can add you afterward as well. And if you're interested in joining the STEM to the Sky team, um, we have the link on the screen right now. And I think Sasha can also put it in the chat. But we have seven different sub teams that you can join. So there's definitely um, something for everyone's interest. So we hope you can join us. And also, if you have any questions, you can always email us at stem to the sky at gmail.com. Yeah, thanks, Eileen. Um, and that concludes today's speaker panel. Thank you so much to our incredible panelists, Dr. Lynn, Dr. Weigold, and Lila for taking the time to share all of your valuable experiences and advice in your respective medical journeys. Um, it was very insightful learning about the multitude of opportunities and pathways that can lead to pursuing medicine. We also wanted to thank everyone here today um, for taking the time to attend our event. And I also want to extend a congrats to Sarian and Naga, who are STEM to the Skies marketing and outreach directors and the hosts for today's panel. Um, they did a great job. And we also wanted to share a feedback form that we will put in the chat right now. So as attendees, if you have any feedback for us on how we can improve or what you liked about this event, um, feel free to quickly fill that out and it would be a great help to us. Um, again, if we can get to your questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to the panelists. We hope that you enjoyed hearing from them and that you gained some new insights. And yeah, we can't wait to see you again at our future Send to the Sky events. Um, I'll pass it on to Anaga now to finally wrap up the event. Yeah. Um, so if any of you have any additional questions or suggestions for STEM to the Sky, please feel free to stay behind for a few extra minutes, and we'd love to chat with you. But if not, um, don't forget to fill out the feedback form, and thank you everyone again. Um, have an amazing rest of the day or night, um, depending on where you're joining us from. Bye. Thank you, thank you thank everyone. You thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.